Is the concept of male leadership in the home outdated? If not, how can we effectively lead our families in today's shifting society? Tonight, we'll be discussing this topic, how can we better lead our families? Join B.J. Clark and Joshua Posey as they sit down with Mike Hickson tonight on GBN Live. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Welcome to GBN Live. I'm Mike Hickson. So glad to be with you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. We're always happy to have the opportunity to come into your home on a Thursday evening. We have tonight Joshua Posey. And Joshua, this is the first time you've been on the program, and we certainly want to welcome you. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Also have B.J. Clark. B.J. has been on the program many, many times, and B.J. is always great to work with you as well. Always a pleasure. Tonight we discuss how can we better lead our families. And no doubt if you look at the world around us, and particularly our nation, it's no secret the family's in trouble. And so what we want to do is try to rectify the wrongs that are ongoing in the family today. And I guess as we begin, what about the family in terms of God's view of the home? Right. Uh, you know, there's no more important subject we could discuss. And in the book of Genesis, God is the author of the family. It belongs to Him. He's the one who designed it. And who are we to come along and say, we don't like your design. We're going to change it up. Uh, God's given us the exact thing that we need to guide and govern our families. The ultimate happiness is found for the family, not by going away from the principles of this book, but by delving into what this book says and being the kind of moms and dads and children, husbands, wives, etc., that this book teaches us to be. And that's really what uh, we're focused on tonight is how this book can help us to be the family God always wanted us to be. You know, B.J., and, and of course, uh, Joshua, as we think about the home, the family, and the fact that God is the author of the home, the family, it's interesting to note that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God made man, God said it's not good for man to be alone. And today, there are so many different dynamics with regard to the home. And, you know, now we have same-sex families, and, and that is a whole other subject. But nonetheless, it's something that we've got to talk about with regard to the family because the whole dynamic picture of the home ha has changed dramatically. God created a woman to meet the needs of the man, and they're the perfect complement for one another. So how do we address the changing dynamics of the home in relationship to the 21st century? I think one of the most important things in this discussion is that the reason these discussions are needed is because so many people have left the guidance, as Brother Clark said, from God's Word. They have diverted away from it, uh, and that's brought up the problems of the home. Yeah, don't, don't you think it's significant in Matthew chapter 19 when the religious leaders of Jesus' this day ask, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Jesus responded to that question with a question, and He asked, have you not read? Do you think one of the real problems in our society today is we have we have strayed from the textbook with regard to the family, and as a result of that, we're, we're facing many, many problems. And you remember that he said, from the beginning, it was not so. And there are so many things that are happening today that we could point at and say, that may be what's happening today, but from the beginning, it was not so that there was some confusion about gender identity. God was very clear and distinct, male and female created He them. There was no confusion. That's exactly how God created them to be. And uh, there shouldn't be any confusion today because the things that made a person a male and a female back then are still the things that identify one as a male or female today. The only difference is, is that we've allowed men's fuzzy feelings to become the standard by which things are determined rather than objective truth. And we've got to get back to the objective truth of God's Word, whether it be the duration of the home, uh, the identity of those who can make up the home, etc. From the beginning it was not so. We need to get back to the beginning. It was perfect at the beginning. We need to get back to that. That's right. You know, we talk about the cultural changes in the world in which we live. One of the things that we want to talk about tonight, the male leadership 
that is to exist in the home. Sadly, many men, many men have abdicated their responsibility as a spiritual leader in the home. Some would say that that mode of thinking is outdated. How do you respond to that? I think the simple answer is, is no. You know, the, the winds of change in our society blow so quickly. What was acceptable yesterday is not today. What's accepted today will not be acceptable tomorrow. Uh, and as God's people, as we've talked about, we have to quit paying attention to the winds of change and draw our attention back to God's Word because it's, it's His plan. And God's plan never goes out of date. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 and verse 21 tell us two of the reasons God made us. One is to bring Him glory and another is to praise Him. And so when men and women place their self in God's plan for the home, it brings God glory. And we shouldn't divert from that. Well, I think so. And, and I appreciate what you said uh, with regard to that, to that question. And, you know, we talk about the home and the, the changing dynamics of the home, but God's Word never changes. Culture changes, but God's Word is timeless. The psalmist said, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven in Psalm 119.89. And, of course, in Psalm 119.105, the psalmist said, Your Word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my pathway. God's Word is intended to give direction to the human family. And I think about you know, a couple of byproducts of studying God's Word. One is education. The second is elevation. God's Word is intended to educate us with regard to the family. It will also elevate the family if we'll only follow the precepts. Exactly. And part of those precepts have to do with the male spiritual leadership that you mentioned. If you go back to God's book and let God define it, Genesis chapter 3 points out creation and the order of creation as Paul would allude to in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, all those things are still true. In Genesis chapter 3, you'll remember in verse 16, this is God talking to the woman. God talking to the woman, not BJ or Mike or Joshua, but Almighty God told the woman, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee or for thee. He's going to be in charge in a position of male spiritual leadership. Well, who made him that way? God did. Someone says, but I don't like that. Well, go make a universe, make your own human beings, and you can decide how you want it arranged. But wait a minute, I can't do that. You can't do that. No one watching can. So what should we do? Bow to the one who did already do it and say, your rules are yours, and they make perfect sense. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is giving this idea of someone being in charge, and even Jesus Christ has someone that's depicted as being his head. That doesn't denigrate him or make him some kind of inferior being. It just means that he subordinated himself willingly to someone in authority, and uh, notice in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul says, I would have you know, the head of every man, it's Christ. The head of the woman, it's the man. The head of Christ is God. So if Christ can have a head and not be offended by that and willingly subordinate himself without being some kind of second class you know, being, then we should recognize that saying that a woman is in subjection to a man, well, remember, the man's in subjection to someone too, and that's Christ. And so, if we follow God's order of things, then uh, we have no problems. You know, as we, as we think about the question, how can we better lead our families, I think one of the templates for success, and you, and you talked about the male leadership, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God clearly instructed Moses to teach the children of Israel the, the important role that they had in, in really laying a biblical foundation for their children. And if you look at the history of the Israelite nation, you know that they had problems staying faithful to God. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and, and I know that Paul said the things that were written before time were written for our learning. So we can glean something from the past, and God said, to the children of Israel, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And he said, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Now, if it worked then, will it not work today? Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's exactly what Proverbs 22, 6, the, the general consensus of, of the proverb is, when you train up a child in the way he should go, he will not depart from it. Um, and 
that's what Proverbs 22, 6, when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. And so as, as godly parents, our role is to spend time showing the word and living out God's word and teaching God's word in every way that we can. And that's, that's one of the greatest ways, like you said from Deuteronomy yeah. 6. You know, I think about Joshua. Joshua was a great leader. He was the successor to Moses. He became uh, the one who would lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And of course, Joshua in chapter 24 said, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And so he had a God-centered home. But in Judges chapter 2, the Bible talks about the people that were living during the days of Joshua. They were faithful. The, the, the people that were living during the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, they were faithful. But then the Bible says, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. So the question is, how that happened? Right. When you read Psalm 78 and you see verse number 3, he talks about things which we have heard and known. And then he says this, Our fathers have told us. Okay, now what? We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, His strength, His wonderful works that He's done. Verse 5, He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. And this domino effect just keeps going if we follow the pattern God gave us and people keep learning. We pass on a lot of things as family heirlooms, precious things. Uh, my my great-grandmother had this. It's been passed on down. There's nothing greater to pass down than what Lois and Eunice passed Absolutely. down to Timothy. And you know what? That wasn't an accident either. No. When you read of the genuine faith that dwelt first, First, in his grandmother, in his grandmother Lois, then in his mother Eunice, and then he said, and I am persuaded in you also. You know, in Psalm 78, I appreciate you bringing that verse up, or that psalm up, BJ, because, you know, in verse 70 said, that they may set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that, that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. And so, you know, the template for success is there if we'll just follow it. Absolutely. Got a question that's come in by email tonight. What are the most important things that parents can do to best improve the chances of their children remaining faithful? Great question. Absolutely. One of the great examples from the Bible that I always go to when I think of a leader in a family is Abraham. Um, Abraham was a great leader for his family. But one of the things that I notice as I read through the story is that everywhere Abraham went, he made it a point that he built an altar to God. In Genesis 12, near Shechem, near Bethel, Genesis 13, near Hebron, everywhere he went, he built an altar to God. And I know that his family, they knew that. They saw that. They saw his consistent faithfulness to God. Consistency is one of the greatest things we can show other people because nobody recognizes hypocrisy more than children. That's right. You know, great example. Abraham was a great man of faith. As a matter of fact, he's called the friend of God. And, and I think about the tremendous faith that he demonstrated throughout his life. And of course, he's listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And God had tremendous confidence in, in him as uh, a father, according to Genesis chapter uh, 18. And, and there are other role models there. But you look at the life of, uh, of a, man by, um, a man like Abraham, you have to be inspired uh, by his example, don't you? Yeah, I love what Joshua pointed out here, and you just alluded to it. No wonder God could say in Genesis 18, 19, I know him. What do you know about him? That he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Well, how did God know that about him? Because that was the characteristic of his That's life. Exactly no matter right. where he lived, this was all about God, and the children saw that. And don't you think, you know, we talk about living a God-centered life. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But then Paul in Colossians chapter 3, he said concerning Christ, who is our life. You know, if, if our children see that, that the Lord is everything to us, it, it's hard for people to rise above their leaders. But if we are the leaders that we ought to be in the home, then that's going to inspire our children, hopefully and prayerfully, to live godly lives. Another question's come in. What if there is no Christian man in the house and the wife is a Christian? Can the wife train the kids? Good question. I think one of the first things that comes to mind in this question, of course, is an, 
an encouragement to the wife from 1 Peter chapter 3. That uh, if the husband is not fulfilling his duty, 1 Peter 3 and verse 1, Wives, be, sub be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. The example of a godly wife, I don't think can be compared. It's so valuable in the home. Yeah, and you know, B.J., you mentioned Timothy's mother and grandmother. And I think the question could be asked, could be asked, okay, when did they begin cultivating the faith in Timothy? Paul answers that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, doesn't he? I love hearing the story about a mother that was reading the Bible out loud to her infant child on her lap, and someone came up and said, you don't really think he understands a word you're saying, do you? And she said, no, I, I don't think he does right now, but I don't know when he will start comprehending. And I would love for one of his first memories to be of Mama reading the Bible to him. And I love the story I heard about a mother that went to a church building where they were putting in a new sidewalk leading up to the building. And she got permission to take her son's tiny little infant feet and to put them in the cement. And uh, then as the cement hardened, of course, his footprints were hardened there, and she brought him to that spot as he grew older and said, you see those footprints right there? Those are yours. And I did that on purpose to tell you that I always want you to remember to go to worship and to be a part of God's assembly because it will empower you and strengthen you. And you know, mothers, uh, you think of Josiah's mother, must have been an amazing woman because his parents, his father, and grandfather were, were not good men. And so how did he turn out to be so good? There are some individuals, if it were not for their mothers, who knows where they would be. We're so grateful for Christian moms who have uh, in, in, you know, invested so much time in their children's here and hereafter. Well, no doubt. I know that, I know that Samuel's mother, Hannah, was not a single mom. But what impresses me about, about her is the fact that she prayed fervently for a child. And she said with regard to that child, as long as he lives, he will be granted or lent to the Lord. Her desire was for that child to be a servant of God. And, and, and so can mothers have that kind of influence on their children? And you think about Samuel as a great prophet of God. Yes, they can have a tremendous influence on their children. Absolutely, and the, the command in Ephesians 6 is for fathers to bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But if the father's not doing that, the child shouldn't suffer. Uh, the child should still be given the opportunity to be brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, even if it comes from the mother. So yes, her responsibility is great. And there have been a lot, there have been a lot of of women who have been spiritual leaders in the home because the father wasn't a Christian or had abdicated that responsibility. You know, in Proverbs 31, we read of the worthy woman. And, and she was a woman given to domestic responsibilities. She was bivocational, but, but she was a woman that feared the Lord. And, and the Bible says her children rise up and call her blessed, her, her husband also. But you think about the impression that she left upon her children. And though the husband has, as we know already, divine authority to lead the home, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says, I will therefore, verse 14, younger women marry, bear children, and then next, guide the house. The word there means rule. She, she has rule over the children as a mom. And it's not one of those deals where she has to say, you wait till your daddy gets home. She might say that and uh, send fear into the heart of the children. But she has the divine authority to rule that house whether daddy's home or not. And the children need to learn to respect her uh, because she's mama and she needs to be listened to. Good stuff. Good stuff tonight. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. How fast can you run? If you're like me, it's not as fast as you used to. Did you know that the fastest man alive can run almost 30 miles per hour? Astounding as that might sound, there's one thing that neither he nor we will ever be able to outrun. Our past will always catch up with us. That's what the Bible says. Take note, be sure, your sin will find you. Oh, and when it does, it can bring some of the darkest feelings, remorse, regret, bitterness, hatred, guilt. The past can be brutal. 
But thanks be unto God, we don't have to feel that way. And that's what our new book's all about. It's called Forgiven, Forgiving, and Free. The Peace of Living Without a Past. Four brief chapters can help us literally break through those awful feelings of yesterday. Four chapters can help us come to know the grace that God offers us and the gracious spirit that, well, we should be offering each other. Four chapters. Forgiven by God, forgiving myself, forgiving others, forgiving God. It's a short, simple read, but one that can help us change the way we think about ourselves, each other, and even God. So I hope you'll find it very helpful, if not life-changing. Forgiven, forgiving, and free. The peace of living without a past. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comment section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. We are back and we are talking tonight about how we can better lead our families. We've had a great discussion thus far. And as we pick back up in our conversation tonight, what advice would you give to young families who are just getting started? Because I know that really it's always good to get, you know, to get off, get, get started right. And so what are some things that, that might help young families today? I'm reminded of the story Brother Clark mentioned just a moment ago of a mother who was reading the Bible to her child even though the child may not understand what she's reading. Um, I think the best advice we could give to any parent, uh, I have a two-year-old and a seventh-month-old right now, and uh, is just to saturate them in God's Word. If we want our children to develop faith, we know Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So saturating our families in God's Word is, is a great place to begin. Well, no doubt. B.J.? He just mentioned the first word that I often use in a sermon on this, educate. Educate them in the Word of God to demonstrate. Practice what you teach and preach and show them not just what the Bible says, but show them how to live out the Bible in your life. And then third, participate in their lives. Be aware of who their friends are. Know what they're going through and, and be there to listen to them and to talk to them. Uh, don't be one of those dads where the daughter says, how much do you make an hour? And he says, why do you need to know that? And she says, I thought if I found out how much you made an hour, I could buy an hour of your time. I don't want to be that dad. I want to be involved in my children's lives. Someone said the mom knows exactly the minute they were born, their weight, their height, uh, their, or their length. And she knows their friends, their teachers, and the father is vaguely aware that some short people are living in his house. I don't want to be that guy either. I want to be involved and connected. And then fourth, supplicate. Um, Brother Robert R. Taylor Jr. tells about a soldier overseas who was invited to go and participate in some activities that he should not have been involved in. He was headed to do that very thing when the ch sound of the clock, local clock, started tolling. He looked up and he did the math in his head real quick and thought, back home, my mother is at Wednesday night prayer meeting and she's praying for me not to be involved in the very things I'm about to, to do. And the memory of a praying parent caused him to say to his buddies, look guys, I'm, I'm going back. Y'all, uh, I'm just not going. There's power in that. And so those, those things right there make a big difference in helping any age parent. I think those are excellent answers. Uh, you triggered a thought as, as you guys were talking a moment ago. Do you think it's possible that, that as parents sometimes we focus so much on trying to give our children the material things in life. And, and of course, we want to give them the best education possible, but maybe we neglect the spiritual 
dimension of life, and, and as a result of that, we end up losing our children. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, there's so much effort that is put into so many things that, that can be good, things like travel ball and other things that so much time is put into it uh, that other things are neglected. You know, if we as parents were to put as much time into making sure that our children were involved in the activities of the congregation, uh, to be involved in a, a Bible-saturated and a prayer-saturated congregation that uh, invests in our children, there's also no greater example to our children than other believers to surround them outside of the family. And, you know, we talk about precedence. As, as, as a young family, you, you think about, you mentioned travel ball, and I know that, that our kids want to be involved in sports and extracurricular activities, and that's good. But one of the real dangers that I see and one of the tendencies I see today is, is parents who are Christians allowing their children to miss services because of a ball game or, or maybe miss Wednesday night Bible study because they got a test the next day and so they got to study for a test. And, and to me, the question I ask is, okay, what message are you sending to your children? You know, we'll crisscross the country for uh, tournaments and ball games and things of that nature and think nothing of a five or six hour drive sometimes to the place where the World Series of Little League is being played or whatever the sport. And yet sometimes those same children that are used to doing that for secular type events and recreation have never known driving even 45 minutes to go to a gospel meeting or something of that nature. And we sometimes say, well, we're just too busy. Well, yeah, we are. And that's part of the problem. I was thankful for godly parents who taught me that uh, there was nothing more important than Bible study. I was not a star tennis player, but I was on the tennis team in high school. And my uh, manager, coach, came to me and said, look, uh, and I had already been practicing for three hours. And I went up to him and said, coach, I've got to go. I've got Bible study tonight. He seemed, he said, I want you to play a practice match against so-and-so. I said, I, I can't do that right now because I need to go. I'd already been there three hours. The next day he called me and he said, Clark, you have a decision to make. I'll give you over the weekend to decide. And I said, well, I really don't need the weekend. Uh, that decision was made a long time ago when I became a member of the church. I would never have been taught that or known that if I hadn't been taught that by godly parents. I didn't lose out. I gained and so this is the thing. So many things we're investing so much time in now, 25, 30, 40 years from now aren't going to matter in this eternal scheme of things. So true. I was just doing a gospel meeting and after one of the evening services, a young girl came to me and she said uh, that all week she had been struggling with a decision. They had a band concert in the middle of the week and uh, her parents had said, we know that you are mature, you're a a Christian, you've made the decision to obey, we're going to let you decide what to do. And she said she went back and forth and she eventually went to her band director and told her band director, I can't come to the competition, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be at the gospel meeting. And it ultimately led to her in the principal's office. And she told me that band competition was tonight. And I was here. And it gave me such peace when I came and studied God's Word. And think about not only the example that that she had from her family, but think about her example to the people sure. around her. That's right, that's right. Well, again, showing the world that there are things that are more important than the temporal. Mm -hmm. And in, in this day and time, look, everybody's thinking about the here and now, and yet we're talking about, I think about the Hebrew writer when he talks about those people of faith who look for a, a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And as you said, BJ, you know, for some of us, you know, 50 years from now, what's it going to matter? I mean, really what's going to matter is did we focus on spiritual things and not temporal? And all that, I think, begins back to the question we're looking at of the advice for young parents. When it comes to, to entering as a parent, there is nothing greater than we can just show our children that mom and dad truly think Jesus is precious in their life and they're willing to do anything for him. And when they see that, they'll follow that example through their life. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and you know, one of the thought, just very quickly, but I know that, I, I know school work is important and we want, our, we want our kids to do well in school. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, a B or a C in history is not fatal to the soul. Yeah. And, and I think that 
we ought to encourage our children to, to engage in their Bible studies. Uh, I, I know a young man, uh, he's a young family man now, and he talked about as a young person how he became what he called a Bible geek. As a matter of fact, that's the term he used. But he loved studying the Bible, still loves studying the Bible. And so to teach our children that, you know, studying God's Word can bless your life and, and to impress upon them the importance of this book over all other books. Mm -hmm. And do parents ask their children, do you have any homework for your Sunday school class or Wednesday night Bible study? They ask about whether they have any secular homework if they are in, educated in the public school system. They want to know they're checking out their progress there, but when is the last time some parents have asked their Bible school teacher, how's my son doing in Bible class? Is he listening? Is he learning? Are they then going at home and talking about reinforcing the Bible education the child got? You know, that, those things matter. Those things make a difference. No doubt, no doubt. Another question's come in through Facebook. What about congregations changing their Sunday night services to accommodate football season? What does this tell our kids? I think about people that, or I think about congregations that may change their worship services for the Super Bowl. I think there are a lot of congregations, you know, especially today that are uh, permanently changing their services, but to change it for uh, an express purpose of, of something like that, um, I think it does communicate a, a message of, of where on the totem pole is the Lord? Where, where, where do we put him in our list of priorities? You know, the Bible doesn't legislate the time of services on Sunday. It says the first day of the week. But as Joshua just noted, uh, that's... And some service, some churches are more and more going to an early afternoon service to where by the time they're finished, they're finished with the same amount of time in Bible study and preaching they would have had if it had been at 6 o'clock. But uh, yeah, it does kind of make you wonder when folks deliberately change just one time of year for those things. Even though it might be technically permissible on the scale of whether it's right or wrong, uh, the, what message does it send is a, is a fair question. Yeah, absolutely. Another question, someone says, I am a new Christian, but my wife has been a Christian all of her life and has more knowledge than I do. How can I possibly lead her when she knows so much more than I do? Thought-provoking question. Uh, two things initially come to mind. Number one, uh, any gentleman who may be in this situation, first of all, I think he's to be commended. Any man who wants to lead his family and is willing to seek counsel on how to lead his family, that's tremendous. But the second thing that, that comes to mind with this question is that a man's leadership shouldn't be childish or uh, bullying or slavic or anything like that. His leadership should depend and lean on the wisdom and the desires of his wife. And so for this man to have a wise wife who knows the scriptures, that's not a detriment to him. It, that, that's actually a very positive thing. He has a great resource on his side. Yeah. And from the wife's standpoint, how grateful she must be to say, I have a husband who, even though he's new to the faith, is yearning to know this book and is learning it and demonstrating it. And she understands as a Christian because she's been studying for so long that she, even though he's not been a member as long as she has, he's still to be a male spiritual leader and she needs to afford him those opportunities to uh, to grow into that and, and be there to encourage him along the way. But yeah, what a, what a blessing to be a wife that has a husband that wants to be a leader like That's that. Eager yeah. To lead yes. and to lead in a biblical way. Mm -hmm. uh, great thoughts. Another question. What about parents leaving all of the spiritual education to the Bible class teachers? Can they teach our children everything that they need in two hours a week? I think the, the very easy answer is no. <laughs> um, one of the great things that congregations can do, and, and we've implemented this where we are, is, is our Bible class curriculum is something our children can take home. It's actually a set of flashcards, and uh, that helps the parents study at home. One of the greatest things, I think, that prevents families from spending time in God's Word with their children is they don't have a plan. You know, there's nothing set in place, and it's not just going to happen by accident. You know, we have to set a plan in place to study with our family and our children and to review what the Bible says, yeah. facts about it, things like that. And what's the old saying, plan your work, work your plan? You know, the humanists are well aware of the power of time spent in educating. There's a quote that's chilling to read. It's from some years ago in which they were making a 
concerted effort to try to overtake public school education to teach humanistic principles. And they asked this question, what can the Sunday school with one hour a week and only a handful of the children from the community do compared to a steady stream of eight hours a day, five days a week in humanistic education, they realized that that's where it was. If they wanted to change the values of children, they had to do it in the mind. And parents uh, sometimes don't have as much time with their children uh, a day as the certain public schools do. And I'm not saying that all public schools are are you know rotten, but I, every one of them needs to be carefully monitored. And my wife's a public school teacher, and I'm glad she's in that realm and teaching people to the best of her uh, Christian ability. Thankful for good, godly people that work in the public schools, sure. but we also are aware of the dangers, and we can't put our heads in the sand and act like those aren't real. And you know, B.J., in light of what you just said, I want to go back to a thought that 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 you had. Uh, something you had said earlier in the program, and that is there are a lot of external influences on our children. And, and we talk about some of, the, some of the outside forces that are at work, and, and you mentioned the school system, but what about television? And you talked about monitor, monitoring our children. What are they watching? What are they listening to? Where are they going? Who are their friends, et cetera? That, that goes hand in hand with being involved. And, and uh, I think that too many kids today, they, they watch television several hours a day, they listen to all kinds of music, and, and those, those outside forces are shaping and molding their minds. Absolutely, a lot of times those things become the babysitters for the children uh, to keep them preoccupied so that parents can do other things. Um, I think one of the ways that we can combat that is to kind of remind ourselves of what a blessing families are. Um, I mean, that's what I believe is Psalm 127. Uh, children are a heritage of the Lord. Uh, you know, bless the man who has his quiver full of them. Right. Children are such a blessing, and when we view them that way, sometimes children, uh, they take a lot of energy. <laughs> they take time. Sure. And when we actually view them as a blessing from God and not a nuisance or a problem, then we can be much more intentional in the way we spend time with them and the things we let them consume. Uh, even as parents, we have to be careful what we consume and so much sure. more for our children. Well, no question, no question. What about, what about in terms of child rearing? When do we begin talking to our children about modest apparel, drinking, dancing, various types of chemicals or drugs? Th those are things that are pertinent to their well-being. So when do we begin educating them about these things? My wife was talking about this very thing to me recently and she mentioned a situation where someone took the position that, look, you know, uh, I don't have to teach my children that when they're very, very young, even those principles at all, uh, and that the child suddenly realized one day that the rules had changed overnight for them, literally overnight for them, and it was very hard for the child to process. and so. Uh, my wife suggested that at least with the raising of with our children, uh, she tried to follow certain principles of modesty early on. Now we all understand that you know babies are are going to at times you know be in a diaper or things of that nature around people where we wouldn't see that in older children. But the point is that you start teaching them very early on in life and start giving them these principles early so that it's a part of them, it's ingrained in them, and they may not even understand at the time why, but they have been taught by example that this is the way we act and the way we dress. Yeah. Absolutely, as soon as possible. I mean, the world tries to attack our families younger and younger and younger, it seems every day. Uh, and they try to slip into our, our families in such sly ways. The devil just uses so many different sly ways to get into our homes and we have to be on guard to prepare our children and to train them and to, to condition them to what, what they see. You know, the devil has backdoored a lot of families yeah. and, and you mentioned a moment ago the fact that there are some parents that use television as a babysitter. Well, you know, 
what, what you put in ultimately comes out. Uh, you know, the Bible says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so garbage in, garbage out. And so we've got to try to, we've got to try to the best of our ability to protect their minds and, and the shaping of their minds into worldly values. And that, that's, a real, that's a real challenge. You think about these very young girls who are being pushed by moms who want them to be in this pageant or that pageant and they heavily put makeup on these little girls and have them parade around in uh, even outfits that are provocative at that age by the, the things that they're trained to do in the pageant and dances they're told to do and things of that nature. And people look at it and think it's cute and smile. It is uh, disturbing is, is in so many cases, in so many instances because of uh, the fact that the child is being basically taught at a young age that this is what matters in life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the externals, how we look and things of that nature. The internal beauty, First Peter 3 mentioned earlier, is where it's at. Well, that's right. And, and how many kids today, they're 12 going on 22. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, exposure. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, think on these things, things that are going to help you internally be what God would have you to be. We're going to take a quick break. We will be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. Perhaps you've not heard of the new magazine, Reaching the Lost. It's an exciting new publication designed to focus completely on evangelism. And the best part, it's free. We will mail it to your home, mail it to your congregation. And when you get it, you're going to see featured articles with tips for evangelism. You're going to see instructions as to how to make better use of house to house and heart to heart. Inside, you're going to read of conversion stories, successes that congregations are experiencing. You're going to read about the seminars that we're doing and the reports from churches where we're going. If you would like to sign up for this free publication, go to the website, fill out the material, register today. You don't want to miss this exciting opportunity to become a better evangelist in your local community. The Gospel Broadcasting Network is proud to bring you GBN Live. To have your questions answered on the program, please call us at 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. Please try to keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic. If you have a different topic that you would like to have discussed on GBN Live, please email your request to gbnlive at gbntv.org and we will do our best to accommodate your request. Thank you for staying with us. We are back for the final segment of our program tonight, and we are discussing how can we better lead our families. And I guess one of the questions we want to address tonight, what can we do to the best of our ability to ensure faithfulness on the part of our children? Because ultimately, our goal, you alluded to Psalm 127 a moment ago, and the goal of every parent, every godly parent, is, is to see their children in heaven one day. Absolutely. I think uh, one of the words that always comes to my mind and one of the words I'm learning as a young parent now is the word consistency. Um, consistently putting God's word before our families. I mentioned a moment ago that, uh, you know, we need to have a plan. Have something set in place to where I know without fail something I'm going to go to to train my children. And so many families uh, use a family Bible time at night to do that, to speak about God's word, to pray with their children. Um, a, a child who sees a faith lived out will more than likely follow that example. Just like uh, the, the example of influence we gave a moment ago of television and, and all these things that, that children, they're taking in all the time. Well, when they take in the godly influence of a parent, they're going to follow that example as well. That's right. That's right. BJ? Yeah, we, we mentioned earlier this educate, demonstrate, participate, and supplicate idea. Well, Proverbs chapter 4 gets into this, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. And then notice, I give you good doctrine. So we've got to give good teaching to our children. And notice, he says then to the child, Forsake ye not my law. Well, what does that imply? that even someone who's given good doctrine can make the free moral choice to forsake that good teaching, Allah, the Garden of Eden. Yeah. 
Did God give Adam and Eve good doctrine yes, about what to do and what not to do? Yes. Is there one thing, if He'd only told them this one more thing, they would not have partaken of the forbidden fruit? Is it, was He an absent father? No. Was He an ins insufficient educator? No. Is, if God could teach all of the right things and be just the right perfect father to Adam and Eve, then we got to get to the second part of this, and I will confess, in my early years of preaching, I did a whole lot more preaching to parents than I did to children about what to do with what their parents were teaching them. And in Proverbs 4, you'll notice both are in, involved. Verse 13 of Proverbs 4, after he says in verse 11, I've taught you in the way of wisdom. He then says in verse 13, take fast hold of the instruction, let her not go, keep her, for she is thy life. And so it's just as much the responsibility of the child to hold fast to what they've been taught as it is for the parents to provide the good teaching and we're free moral agents. And uh, Satan, if he is going to go after people taught by God, who do I think I am to think he wouldn't try to go after my children as well when they don't have nearly as good a father as Adam and Eve had? Well, Great points, great points. Absolutely. Um, I agree 100%. Um, there is a two-sided road to faithfulness. Um, the teaching, which is absolutely necessary, and then the decision of the child. And God has given us all decisions. Um, I mean, that's we mentioned Joshua 24, 15 earlier, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Um, and every person has that responsibility. And I, 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 that's 100% true. We need to be teaching more about children obeying their parents as well. It is, it's, it's two sided. And, and you look at the book of Proverbs and, and Solomon is addressing his son. You know, I think about chapter two, my son, if you receive my words, chapter three, my son, do not forget my law. And he says, but let your heart keep my commands. Why? For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. How many parents today, they want the best for their children? Well, to put them, to put them in the position to enjoy a good life, a blessed life. Right. You know, Mary was the best mother that could have been selected for Jesus, else God would not have chosen her to be the mother of Jesus. And there's a passage in John 7 that's quite interesting. Uh, the Bible says there, His brethren did not believe in Him. At that point in time, they didn't. Well, who was their mother? Mary? Are you telling me she did not try to teach her other children who Jesus was? I know she did. I know that she would have identified Jesus and she would have tried her dead level best to teach it. Now later James and Jude, who didn't believe at one point, would become believers and actually write uh, portions of the Word of God. And so we see that we don't give, and that's maybe a good lesson for parents too, is if you have a child that's gone astray or that doesn't yet believe, don't give up on them because we see some other examples in Scripture where children who don't understand something at this point in time later embrace it fully and actually help to spread the word. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What about, what about parents whose children or maybe a child goes astray and becomes unfaithful to the Lord? What are some things that, that those parents can do to, to reclaim that prodigal child? I think in the same situation that we see all throughout Scripture, um, anytime, Galatians chapter 1, if someone's overtaken in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You go after them and do what you can to encourage them to come back. Uh, it's like we, we mentioned a moment ago, you know, obedience that is required and forced is not true obedience. Um, and so the, the effort would be to go and say, I want you to come back. I want you to be faithful to God. And then again, that choice lies on their shoulders. The prodigal son in Luke 15 knew something. He knew that he could go home. He knew that his father would at least accept him back as some kind of, he didn't realize the depth of his father's love until he got home and saw it in even more you know, vivid fashion. But our children need to know that we care. And if they go astray, we, we let them know, look, I love you still. Your mom and I tried to teach you these things from the time you were a child for this reason. We want you to go to heaven. That's where we want to go. We want to be with you in heaven. 
And please don't let anything derail you from that. Even if you leave what you've been taught, we'll still love you, but we're going to plead with you to return because we don't want you to miss heaven. The first time that I held my first child in my arms and I looked down at his tiny little face and hands and feet, I thought to myself, I'm not just looking at flesh. Inside this little tiny fleshly body, there is an eternal soul, an immortal soul that's headed somewhere and that's ever on my mind as a parent. It is, and that's the whole goal of trying to teach the right things so that we all end up in heaven together. No, I can't help but think, I, I've, I have thought often about parents that as they, as they have grown older in life have confessed that maybe they weren't the best parents in terms of leading by example, in, in terms of rearing their children in the Lord, and so they lament their mistakes. And, and I have seen children that have grown up in that kind of atmosphere ultimately come back to the Lord. But from a parent's perspective, let, let's say they drop the ball. And as a result of that, their children are not what they ought to be. And maybe the parents, as they grow older in life, they are restored or they get their lives right. And, and they continue to beat themselves up over the past. But what are some things or what, are, what, what could they, should they do in terms of reclaiming their children? Would, would it be in order to go to their children and just say, you know, look, I failed you, that, that we weren't what we ought to be? I know one couple told me, they said, you know what, we were so involved in our business. And, and you know, if we had it to do over again, we wouldn't do it. Fortunately, the, a couple of their children came back. But, but what are some steps that they could take to, to maybe maybe some things that they could say that would resonate with the children. I, I understand that that would probably take a, a great amount of humility uh, to be willing to say that. Um, but clear communication, I think there, there's no uh, comparison to it. To clearly communicate the things that, that we feel um, and we express, you know, that's part of our relationship to one another as Christians. Uh, we communicate to one another our burdens and we help bear one another's burdens. Um, and to a child, I think it would play the same role to communicate clearly. You know, I have made a mistake. I have messed up. And, and this is what I want you to know about that mistake. And I want you to know to avoid it and that I'm sorry that I did it. That, that humility is contagious potentially because you're not asking the child to confess wrong without also being willing to examine yourself and say, hey, you know what? In fact, one of the finest Christian men I ever preached was a part of the local congregation where I preached, came to me with tears in his eyes one day and snowy white hair and said, look, in my youth, I was not the leader in the home that I should have been for my children. And I try to tell them now that I'm sorry that I didn't lead them in the right way. And all you can do is you can't, you know, unring the bell or unscramble the egg, but you can try to, you know, manage the situation as it exists. Plead with your children to forgive you for your neglect if that is the case. And then show them an example and never quit praying and never quit trying to love them and reach out to them and let them know that you want them to, to come along with you. Can't help but think about David after being confronted by Nathan. He acknowledged, of course, his wrongdoing, his sin. And David was a man after God's own heart, and yet the humility that he had to confess and acknowledge his wrongdoing, you mentioned the prodigal son. I do think that, as you said a moment ago, humility, and, and for our children to see that we're, we're, we are saying to them, look, we, we are not perfect. We've made our mistakes. We ask you to forgive us, and here's what we want for you now as, as, as our children, as flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones. And it, Mike, let me just make one quick observation because you've brought something up just now that lets me know this is really a case-by-case -case basis. We've got some parents out there who have been perhaps, as we've just n noted, neglectful. Others, frankly, have been to the best of their ability. They're human, so they're not perfect. The father in Luke 15 did nothing wrong. In Luke 15... It was a prodigal self-centered decision that led him to make those decisions that he made. He came back and the loving father was willing to accept him back. 
So that's why both parents and children both need to do some self-evaluation and whoever needs to repent, and if that's both of them, then both. If, if it's one of them, then let the one do it and hope it leads to the other. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Another, another question tonight via Facebook. Can you give your thoughts on the effect of video games, cell phones, and similar items on our children? I think one of the biggest pieces of advice is just involvement. Be involved in what your ki children are consuming. Know what it is. I mean, there, there are so many web websites out there. Uh, I believe one's called Kids in Mind or some other, uh, where you can go and look at every uh, word that's used in a uh, show your child may be watching or every graphic scene or, uh, you know, God forbid, any nudity or anything like that. You can be aware of what's going on. Uh, absent mindedness doesn't help. Uh, us know what's going on. We have sure. to be fully involved. What about one other thing before, before we close tonight? We haven't talked about discipline. And today there are a lot of parents that do not believe in corporal punishment. So biblically speaking, what responsibilities rest upon parents? Discipline is a requirement in the home. Now there's a challenge to find the right uh, grip pressure, if you will, on how to do it. Now, a wet bar of soap, if you hold a wet bar of soap too loosely, it will fall right out of your hand. If you try to hold a wet bar of soap too tightly, it will squirt out of your hand in the other direction. And so as a parent, you're looking for the right grip pressure, so Balance. to speak, when it comes to discipline. There are times when I would say I was too harsh in my words or in my manner. There were other times when I think I was too wishy-washy. Uh, and so I, and I will confess to my children, look, I don't always have this fear. I know I'm always trying to accomplish the goal of leading to holiness in your behavior. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a challenge. And the Bible, God knows what makes human beings tick. And he gave us the Bible and the book of Proverbs still teaches a rational, measured dose of discipline that can include a swat on the backside, and uh, that can still teach things uh, in a very memorable way. <laughs> Lasting impressions. That's right. I've heard uh, many different uh, percentages. I've heard people say 80% of the time you should encourage with 20% discipline. The thing that's always stuck with me uh, is that love should be a constant. Um, and when love is a constant, discipline will come promptly. It's Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. And so love is a constant. And when there's a need for discipline that comes in and then love remains because discipline is a product of love. True. BJ, in just a couple of sentences, how can we better lead our families? By just sticking with this book right here, never departing from it. This is your owner's manual for how to raise human beings from the God who made human beings and who knows what it takes to cause human beings to live and act a certain way. Let's trust God and do what his word says. Well said. Thank you guys so much for being here. Appreciate your Great questions and answers, and we appreciate so much your willingness to be a part of the program tonight. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you for being a part of our program. As always, we hope to see you back here again next Thursday night. Until then, God bless and keep you. See you then. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.